It's the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams, and we're doing yet another Pint of Science Australia takeover with Ettore Carnalenghi. And Ettore is looking into a bird that I've had a couple of requests to feature, and it's the it's one of our amazing little fairy wrens, the superb fairy wren. Ettore is working through Monash University, and he's exploring the complex family dynamics, the social structure of the superb fairy wren. Ettore, thanks for joining me. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, let's find out how did you get interested in the fairy wren and how did the start of the project come about? So with the fairy wrens, it was kind of luck. In, in the past, I worked with, with other species in uh, other continents, mostly in the Amazon. And, and after my, my master in Italy, and I've always been very interested in social behavior, I moved to Max Planck in Germany to learn more about social networks and, and how this computational technique can help biologists to, to investigate social structure in, in animals and in birds. And, and in this period, uh, uh, there was this possibility to do a PhD on the super fairy wren and having the possibility to use this kind of technique, the social network analysis, to investigate it. And, and I, I thought it could have been a great opportunity for me. And at the beginning, I was a bit scared since it was not a, a species living in a remote place and as, as I used to, to do in the past. And it's something I really enjoy about being in the field in remote areas. And the superb fairy wren is quite the opposite. It's quite still, luckily, is still quite common. Songbird in, here in southeast of Australia, even if it's uh, declining, as many other species of, of passerines. And then this offered me the opportunity to really spend a lot of time in the field, almost every day for years, and observe and take a lot of data, collect a lot of data, and answer biological questions that otherwise I, I would have not been able. And day after day, I really got in love with these amazing little birds. Well, let's step it out. What is the question that you're trying to answer in your PhD work? So I'm trying to understand how the social structure of the population is it organized like the, the society, we can say. How is the society of this little bird? And super fairy wren are, are cooperative breeding birds. And, and that's another good reason to be in Australia, because if you're interested in cooperative breeding birds, uh, Australia is one of the hotspots in the world. Here we have a lot of species with this breeding strategy, which means that the, the parents, so, so some of the offsprings of, of a pair of, of individuals stay in the territory sometimes for years, helping the dominant pair to raise uh, the offsprings. And so they form these stable groups. And, and this is already very interesting from many points of views if you're in, interested in social behavior. And usually many biologists in studied cooperative behavior during the breeding season because it's, it's, it's when it was considered to be particularly interesting. But I'm focusing on the non-breeding season. And and then non-breeding season, it, it's a black box to really understand complex social behavior because we know from other systems, for example, in, in the teats in the Northern Hemisphere, and then there are a lot of great studies on, on their social behavior and social com- complexity in Oxford. We know that non-breeding season is where, when a lot of, interesting stuff happens, like a lot of complex behavior. And it was something nobody really looked at. So that was my main frame during PhD, understanding what happened in, in this long period that is something like seven uh, months, uh, a bit less sometimes when they're not really on their breeding territory, feeding the offspring. What do they do? And uh, and yeah, like my PhD starts from there. And, and from there, I start to develop my questions when I start to understand a bit more how the system was, was organised. Okay, well, let's sort of introduce the superb fairy wren 
to the audience because not everybody will know the bird. The bird is tiny. You mentioned the 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 tit, the British tits. The superb fairy wren is a similar size. It's just looking at my desk for reference. They're smaller than your computer mouse. They're about maybe two thirds the length of a computer mouse, or or even half. But they're tiny. But they have a long tail. So the tail's what one one and a quarter the length of of the body of the bird held erect mm. most of the time. I had a family of of wrens living at a place that that I lived in, and they're they're not timid birds. They're quite they're quite unafraid of people once they're used to them. I think, but they are pretty much living on the lower level. I I don't think I have ever seen one higher than about three meters up in a bush, a big shrub. I I can't ever think of one higher than that, higher than a roof line, really. So have I got have I got most of that right? Are my assumptions about the bird correct? Do they always down low in the yeah, scrub? That's, that's, that's really that's really correct. They really rarely fly on, on, on trees, only when they are scared from ground predators, such as us sometimes. But usually they are on the ground. And and then and they're dimorphic. The male is blue and has the strong blue and beautiful color, while females are brown. And uh, and the male, the males have a have a blue tail, whereas the females have a brown tail. But and the males will molt into an eclipse eclipse plumage that really mirrors the females and this is how i always assume that the and that the immature males only present into breeding plumage if they are either part of a dominant pair or are challenging to be part of a dominant pair otherwise they remain in their eclipse plumage and cooperate in the family now is it is that right? Because that's a twenty that's a twenty twenty five year old perspective that I I sort of grew up with. Yeah, it's quite right. I was going there, and and yeah, like they, they molt into non breeding plumage during winter, and and then remolt during the breeding before the breeding season in the breeding nuptial plumage, which is quite blue. However, as we said, and since they, they spend a lot of time on the ground, they're easily easy target for predators. So we must imagine that it's, it's really dangerous in a certain way to be so blue and so visible. So what they do is that they molt into a, a non-breeding plumage during winter in order to, to be better concealed when, when foraging on the ground. And then they mold into the blue breeding, breeding plumage, the males. Usually also subordinates mold into the breeding plumage. So all the males tend, usually tend to be blue during the breeding season. What really uh, is different is the time of acquisition of this breeding and uh, nuptial plumage. And so the earlier the males mold into this breeding plumage, and the sexier they are considered by, by females. And this plays a very important role in their society at the end of the non-breeding season. So we, this really happens during the end of the winter, when during the really cold months. So the females look, and, the, and this is something I, I really find fascinating and, and uh, has been studied for many years in, in a population in Canberra, and also in, in the group where I'm, where I'm doing research at the moment, females really remember the first individuals to molt into this breeding plumage. And after months, when they are laying eggs, usually two, four days before laying eggs, 
Uh, 20 minutes before dawn in the morning, they fly to the territory of that males and they mate with this guy, with the super sexy one, and then come back. And in fact, in the super fairy wren, we know that up to 75% of the offspring are not, are not of the social father of, of the territories. So there is a very high level of extra pair paternity in this, in this species, which is another reason why it's so so interesting and also kind of unique because this is it was not considered to be common in many cooperative breeding birds because one of the main mechanism for cooperative breeding bird strategy to be stable which means that subordinates stay for years in the territory it was because it was considered a way for brothers to help raising other brothers or sisters so helping the parents raising the offsprings however given that there is this super high level of extra pair paternity the paradox is that quite often these the subordinates help the parents raising offspring which with, with which they are not related at all because they are from or poorly because they are they, their sons and daughters from very different fathers far away how big is a male's territory and you mentioned that the female will come into the early plumage sexy male's territory. So I'm trying to get an idea of how close are these different male's territories to each other and are there female, and let me phrase it better, are male territories a different size to the female territories? Do females actually maintain a territory, the breeding female, or, or how how do they space themselves out? So they they defend a territory as a group. So male dominant, all the subordinates, and the female. And and these territories range from one one hectare to two hectares and and a bit more. And and there are areas where like they are densely packed, very close to each other, and some areas where they are not. And there is a lot of space uh, which is not occupied by territories. We have some areas in the park that are like that, probably are poorer areas in terms of quality of resources. But yeah, these little birds, are, as you mentioned, they're very little. They're like eight, 10 grams with this little long tail. You can fly for a few hectares exactly to the place where the, the dominant male has the territory. And this is quite fascinating because they need to remember this male for a long time. And and they need to plan. It's something that is really clearly planned. The time and, and when they go and where they go. So with these adjoining territories that are held and managed by family cooperative groups, Many of the different females from all of these groups all coming to see the one super duper early plumage male. That's correct. That's correct. That that it, it was it, what it happens, and and uh, most of the females go to 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 the same male. And uh, what is interesting is that there is not a, a, an effect played by in a certain way, like socially. So the females don't see other females going to the to that male. So it's not all the females agree that, that male is the sexiest. So they they independently go there, and that what the researcher researchers found when did the genetic analysis of the offsprings. Now this is a quite clear pattern. So it's a, it's a kind of yeah, it's planned strategy. Okay, so all of the females within within reach, basically, are coming and being inseminated by that male. But then do they go back to their family groups and then even though they've timed their fertilisation perfectly for them, are they then still having sex with the dominant male in their family group so he doesn't know, he doesn't know what's going on and he's still happy to do the family rearing? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct. That's correct. And and another thing that was studied in Canberra is that actually females get 
benefits from from having helpers because they can easily go looking for for other males and and uh, in a certain way the presence of helpers of helpers liberates the female from spending more effort feeding the offspring and so it's kind of released and can spend more time looking for males the best males at least and because uh, for female usually and and this is not really my topic but i've got colleagues studying studying this and I'm really interested in the behavior of the females female is really important to find a territory so that's the first thing and and sometimes it's not the best territory and they're not the best mates. So it's really important to keep track on where's the best male. And then in case divorce from the male, especially if there is a, a possibility to move to a better place or when, when the subordinates, which usually are the son of the female, start to, to be dominant. So they want to avoid any incest and they don't want to mate with their son. And so that's the moment where they divorce and they move to a different territory. And and all this happens during the breeding season and is already really complex and fascinating. But when you observe what happens during the non-breeding season, there's a, another la- layer of of richness in, in, in social behavior, which was what I was observing during my PhD. So I spent also a lot of time during breeding season together with my colleagues because we had to find the nest for all the territories and find the nest is important because we can bend the offsprings so that we know that the nestlings, when they will grow up, will be like the son and daughters of the social daughters of, of the territory, for example, and we can keep track of their identity and their life to see how will be their life and their, their success will depend on what, mostly. But most of, as I was saying, most of the time during my PhD was during non-breeding season. And in non-breeding season, these table groups, which are the breeding groups, male, female, and the, all the subordinates, um, start to aggregate with other breeding groups, forming like super, some super groups. And then these super groups merge with other stable groups, forming even upper social units, which are quite stable and split daily and, and then reform. And, and, and while doing that, they move in the landscape and then move out of their breeding territories. So when I start PhD, most of the information we're saying that, that the, the species defends territories year round. And what I observe is that it's not true. And in winter, they form this stable, strong aggregation and big social units, which move in the landscape and have like a big area. So yeah, that, okay. that was unexpected. Okay. Well, that, well, that opens up to two questions. What is the size and the organisation of a breeding group? And then what is the size and the organisational structure of this non-breeding marauding supergroup? That's a great question because it's really bigger. So normally like a, a breeding group could be so male and female, so the, 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 the dominant individuals plus the helpers. And, and helpers usually is one or two, rarely three or more. So it's three, four, four individuals, plus all the offspring and of the breeding season, especially of the last nest. So the last nest of the springs, um, in the last nest of the springs, most of, of the offspring then spend the winter together with mom and dad, and, and they form like family group of seven, eight, individuals the females disperse and some of the females disperse uh, at the beginning of the number so after the breeding season and uh, some stay with the family group for all the winter and then disperse to a territory to look for a place at the end of non-breeding season so usually in august august september and so this is like it's a quite quite big group during winter and then they mix with other groups sometime in a very stable way. So they are always together, day after day, with other groups of the 
the same uh, size. So for up to 10, 15 pairs together. And then these supergroups can in turn merge with other groups and supergroups. So for groups of up to 25, 30 individuals sometimes, which move together and stay together and apparently know each other well. And that's one of my questions. Was the function of this, why this complex system evolved? Is there a clear dominant hierarchy in the bigger group? Well, that, that's a great question since not, but it's not something we could, uh, we could test. But since that they spend time all together and, uh, and uh, one of the possibilities that could be also a way for males to advertise and so like the, the bluest, the first to turn blue to advertise their quality to the female before the following breeding season. But apparently it's more related to this upper social social unit emerging is something more related to resources and predation. And that's something that I'm testing during my PhD because the, the resources are scarce in winter and so it's harder to find food. Many individuals die during winter and 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 the attacks of kookaburras and butcher bear increases during winter because these bears usually hunt mostly or more on arthropods and uh, lizards, skinks during summer and spring. In winter, it's harder. So we saw them following and tracking the, the groups and attacking songbirds. So this is one of the main predators to get away with goshawks for them. Now, what's the site of your study, Tore? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm really not sure because the, the park is quite big. And uh, it's Listerfield Park. It's close to Dandenong in, in, uh, in Melbourne. And we have there many territories. I'm following 20, 25 territories. And, uh, and each territory is something between one and two, two hectares. So altogether, it's quite big, the area I'm following. But there is more. Like the, the, the population in the park is really bigger than one I'm following and, and other colleagues have other territories. So at the moment, are you working on your own or is it a team investigating different aspects of the fairy wren in the park? Yeah, it's more teamwork. Most of my colleagues are, are working on, on the super fairy wrens. Some are working on some are working on, on the purple crown fairy wren. So it's like similar and different species, same genus, but living north in, in the Kimberley. But we are a stable group of three, four people working on the, on the superbs, and my colleagues are interested in, in the choice of the of females, in, uh, in personality, and uh, in how temperature and climate change is affecting different features of their life. So we try to help each other collecting information especially when there is to miss nets and to capture all the birds because a big effort is to have the population monitored. So we need to, to have information about all the individuals, male, females, find the nest and, and keep doing it because females arrive like as immigrants. So new birds keep coming. So it's a massive work to keep track of that and, and try to keep the database organized and in order to to answer all the questions we have in mind. And plus, I've, I had colleagues helping me with proper experiments when we had to do experiments, so we had to do daily experiments in, in the field. Okay, well, if you can in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the methodology and what the experiments are. But let's just clear up a few things about the birds' habits. How many breeding attempts can a group make in a season? Could do three, four, sometimes five. We had psychopath females that kept building nests and then abandoning and then building another one and then abandon the nest and then another one. Then depends on a lot on the level of predation, which varies in, in, in years and the level of, of or how often they are parasites and, and they, so they need to abandon when they understand they need to abandon the nest. So 
It so varies a lot. Are they so? Is it usually only one successful clutch in a season, or can they sometimes get through two clutches? Sometimes even three. Successful. Yeah, yeah we had in good years like the last one that was really good. We had a lot of nestlings. It was massive amount of work and. Some territories had three successful clutches. So big groups, it was really hard to, to keep track of the identity and, and remember also all the combination, all the individuals, because for us, every individual is a combination of, of colors. So of, of three different colors all together in a unique combination. And sometimes there are really so many, it's, it's hard for the brain to, to read quickly the color bands and to remember all the combination. And, and this last year, luckily for the ferry ran, at least in, in, in our park, it was a really good year. So they had many clutches successfully. And a successful clutch will give you on average how many fledglings? Well, something like three usually. Yeah. Okay. It's more or less something like three. Yeah. So you might get between sort of seven and ten chicks in a good year from the dominant female. Exactly. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the methodology. And and you did mention that there was some questions that you were posing with the research. But let's talk about the mist netting, that kind of operation. How many of you does it take to do the mist netting? Wet what time do you do it? Is it better to do it early in the morning or in the afternoon? What records do you take when you when you are trapping and handling birds and ringing them? And who do you share that information with if there's ongoing studies in, you know, you're doing the non-breeding season, somebody's doing the breeding season. So... Yeah, I'm really interested in this cooperative gathering, particularly as it's a stressful thing to push to put the bird through. So how does the information get pushed out? Who gets it and what exactly do you do? So in the years since the group expanded, our research group expanded, we start to collect more and more information because more questions raised. And what's always... we we collect is the weight of the individuals, if it's molting, and some measurement of the tarsus of the head. And if we can, we can we sex the individuals. That, that depends on, on the period of the year, because they are, for juveniles, sometimes it's impossible to sex without doing the genetic analysis. And so that's something we always do. And then... Uh, uh, we take blood samples for genetic analysis and uh, and sometimes blood sample for hormones for it's not what I'm doing but other colleagues do that and and sperm in in uh, in the breeding season in some males we take sperms as well and uh, and another colleague is measuring personality when we capture the bird and and as you were saying Capturing the bird is the most stressful moment for the bird itself. I mean, also for us, but but mostly for the bird. So we try to collect all the information in, in that moment so that we don't need to to get to capture him again or her again in uh, in the future. And it's something we usually do in, in group of twos, sometimes alone. But having a, having a bigger group is better because you can open more, more nests. However, we notice that um, especially in some period of the year, there is high high risk of predation. Of first, so we need to be many people in order to keep us always somebody checking the the nets all the time, and that's a protocol we, we inserted to to make sure that no predation during me. So that's a, a risk, a real risk in in the park. Well, any anybody who's familiar with kookaburras and butcher birds, which a kookaburra is a large kingfisher, and the butcher bird is a is a corvid related to our Australian magpie. They're very smart, so they would, I think, quite rapidly learn that when you guys are setting up, there's a big opportunity for a banquet. So, 
how long do you think it, it takes them to work out what you're doing and that there's an opportunity for an easy breakfast? That's a great question. We don't know yet, but my, one of my colleagues in the past noticed this and, and she thought the same individual of, Co- of Kookaburra was following her and, and knew and recognized the poles of the nets and, and, and associate that reward, a positive reward in terms of a meal. And so we tried to move and not be back for too much time on the same area, also because of the birds. Because they learn, like the, the, the superbs are very smart. Sometimes it's, it's scary how smart they are. And, and I think they, they understand and they recognize us carrying poles, especially if we, we walk with a hat and the poles, they sometimes move away and then they don't, just, they don't show up for the entire day. And they immediately move to a different area and, and some, somehow communicate it to, to others. And so that's one of the problems. We don't want to stress too much and uh, capture too much, catch too much the birds because that has consequences. Also in, in the way we can study their behavior without affecting it in the wild, which is one of the unique things of, of the super fairy wren. You can really study them. You can get a lot of information being in the wild. And, uh, and to me, it's, it's something really important to try to answer biological question, not in the lab, but being in the wild and observing and trying to measure things in the wild. Now, you're taking blood samples each time you are capturing birds? Yeah. We try to, to do it at the moment, yes. Yeah. I mean, not if the birds, the same individual has already been caught like a few days before, unless there is a specific yeah. question related to, to the change in hormonal behavior. Otherwise, we avoid to do that. So that I'm guessing that's a fairly new process in the research of, of, the, of the wrens amongst all the cooperative researchers that have been working in this in this location as well as on fairy wrens generally so what has what have those genetic samples told you that you didn't expect to be true or to be the case so in in our case we haven't used it yet is uh, we are collecting the genetic the material to do genetic analysis but since it's a quite a sp- expensive process we are collecting all the information in order to send to a lab. Oh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then in order to minimize then all the also coding part of the work, which is part of the writing codes in order to discriminate offsprings or relative individuals. So now we are storing all the samples and, and soon, hopefully in, in a few months, we will send all the information. And, and we are interested in knowing who personally I'm interested in my population to know who is related to whom, to which other individuals, and if they can recognize each other. Because one of the main consequences of uh, biological consequences in, in terms of, of these complex societies and how they are structured is how cooperation and altruism can spread in the population. And, um, and, and altruism is a super important question in, in, in biology and is also a bit of a paradox in a certain way because individuals, to be altruist, sacrifice something, pay a cost in order to help somebody else. And, um, and, and, and despite this, this paradox, in a, in a Darwinian, in a naive Darwinian way, Altruism is really common and widespread in nature, and all our trillions of cells cooperate with, with each other, and, and individuals of the same species usually cooperate, and sometimes individuals of different species also cooperate in, 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 in the ecosystems. So this is quite widespread, and, and the super population, the super fairy ran, and given that we have all the data about the social network and how often individuals spend time together, how close they are. It's, it's a perfect system to test if they, like the connectedness, how friends they are, is a good way to predict if they're willing to pay a cost. 
and, and uh, to be altruist in order to save somebody else. So this is something I'm, I'm testing during my, my PhD. I'm using the social structure of this population to test questions about altruism in, in wild animals. It's a massive question, isn't it? Because we assume that all of the males that are helping the dominant female, they've all been duped. Yeah, yeah, so, that's true. So, so we assume that they've been duped, but they may actually know. It just might be the way things are. Yeah, that's correct. And what we understand is that there is a, a landscape in the population of genetic relatedness. So even if they're not brother and sister, given that in cooperative breeding species, there are individuals that stay with the parents and stay in the territory for years and years, this brings to what we call a social viscosity, so that the, the population has less migrants and individuals tend to move less. And so at, this as a consequence as the fact that in the average, individuals tend to be more related related with, with each other, even if sometimes not at the same at the level of the breeding groups, as we were saying before, but in, clo in uh, close breeding groups, in breeding territories, there is some kind of genetic relatedness. So I, I want to know if they know that, if individuals know that and, and uh, are able to, to predict and, and behave according, accordingly, or if it's simply a question of friendship, how much time they spend together, if they can really choose who they want to help and according with some particular criteria. But for sure, they do help and they do show this amazing behavior that is typical of, of these and other species, which is called the rodent run behavior. And I remember how I felt the first time I observed it in the wild. It's really interesting. So when one individual, usually of the group, is in real danger, is captured by a predator, or sometimes is in our nets, gives a distress call, which is a call for help. And when other individuals hear these this calls, come closer and try to distract, to get the attention of the predator, and they do this deceptive behavior, like showing to have a broken wing and, and walk like a, like, a, like a rat. That's why it's called road and run. And it's really funny and, and, and it's really effective. They do it to us sometimes when, they, when we miss net. And so when I observed that, I thought it was a great way to, cause, to, to measure altruistic behavior because this is what it is. They risk their life to do that. They come very close to the predator, sometimes up to one meter and a half, one meter, to, to get the attention in order to help their mates and and so this is what what i'm studying and and in order to know if they can recognize individuals from the voice we recorded all the voice of all the individuals when they give this this stress call in the, in the net and then we run some algorithms and functions to test if they could if their calls their voice is different so as we have different voices and, and I can recognize your voice, I can recognize the voice of a friend, if they can do the same. If when they hear somebody calling, they can know who is calling and if they want to decide to help or not according with the identity of the caller. That really does raise some interesting questions, doesn't it, whether they can recognize their social group or perhaps their relatives. And that question of, when they're moving around in that non-breeding sort of supergroup, do they actually know who their relatives are? That's a fascinating question. Atore, I, I mentioned earlier that I was familiar with with the superb, I keep wanting to call it the superb blue wren because that was what I grew up with, but the superb fairy wren. I've seen that distracting behaviour in in my backyard there. The other behaviour I've seen them exhibit as a group is mobbing birds like wattle birds and magpie larks and even individual magpies. Is that common behaviour or is that a localised kind of thing that they might learn and not every group will do the mobbing? No, it's quite common. 
and and an important behavior because as i was saying at the beginning since they are ground dweller birds they are really always at risk of, of predation so they are very vulnerable on that sense so mob, active mobbing and they do it usually together with tornbills at least in in there is a cloud of, of sounds of tornbills mobbing and and uh, scrub wrens, which is a unique sound, which that, that, that that's another topic. Recently, it has been shown that lyrebirds can mimic this mobbing behavior of tornbills all together, and is really effective. And I, I found I, I heard this, and and it was really interesting because it really remind me that the proper mobbing behavior. This is is super. It's a very important behavior for these birds because it's a way to attack the predators and also to teach or show other individuals how a predator is and, and what needs to be considered a threat. So it's a, it's a really important behavior and it's quite common, especially during winter when they are in these big flocks. They do it a lot. They tend to, to mob and, and have a unique call for that is the, the, the mobbing call. Yeah. When you mentioned the thornbills, I, I certainly saw them with brown thornbills and and the scrub wren, the white brown scrub wren that, that was there, but not the shit or the yellow tailed thornbills. They, from my memory, I mean, I couldn't say it was always like that, but the brown thornbills were the were certainly the ones that were joining in on the on the mobbing. mobbing. They seem a bit more pugnacious than than the other varieties. That's for sure. And they live in usually very, very close to each other, especially in winter, they form mixed species flock. And, and so it also fantails a lot. Um, and sometimes they are the first to mob. But yeah, mostly these four species spend a lot of time together and they, for, they have similar foraging guild close to the ground in, in, in bushes and don't go, as you were saying before, to the canopy. So they tend to mob together because they share similar threats and predators. And yeah. So if those species are spending their non-breeding time together and forming these mixed flocks, are they exploiting the same food resources or do they have a slightly different sort of trophic level of the of the food resource? I think they don't compete. I mean, they in a certain way probably their foraging level over overlap, but superbs tend to forage more on the ground, while torbids tend to follow them and stay closer, but tend to forage on low branches or on the bush. So also the way they hunt is different; are more gleaner the torbids while. The superbs really hunt, hopping in the ground and sometimes jumping. Uh, and you see them in the ground jumping and to catch insects and, and uh, butterflies and moths from the ground. And when you think about it, these mixed flocks moving through an area must really clean it out in a day. So they they probably need to move quite substantial different distances in the in the off season. Do they have to stock up? I'm thinking of I've, I've interviewed a lot of people lately about shorebirds, migratory shorebirds, and they arrive in their non-breeding territories and then have to stock up because it's such a long trip back. Is the breeding season there? Does it take an awful lot of resources for the group to to carry out the the cooperative breeding, defending the territory? So do they really need to fatten up in the non-breeding season? Well, it's mostly during the day for this, for this long, these uh, very small songbirds, because they tend, uh, and, and this is quite common in songbirds, they tend to lose weight and very quickly because of the high metabolism they have and, and the fact that they lose a lot of heat. So they tend to try to gain weight in the, in, at the end of the day so that they, they can survive the, the night. Even if uh, recently it has been shown that super fairy wren have torpor and in winter can really go down with the temperature 
and probably is a way to survive cold nights during winter. But yeah, there is an oscillation in, in, in weight during mostly during the day. But then for sure, it is not that they get fat like migratory birds, but for sure, the breeding season is really expensive in terms of, of energy, especially for pairs that don't have helpers because helpers contribute feeding and so they they help and they release some of the pressure from the female. Now you, you just mentioned torpor, so let's explain what that is for people who may not have heard it before. That's a state where the bird doesn't actually hibernate but it's almost a sleep state, isn't it? I'm not an expert on the, on the topic, but... That's why my way of understanding is just reduce the all the metabolic functions, but still being 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 alive in order to yeah to lose less less energy. Yeah, and if, if they recognise an alert call from another species, they can sort of snap to and and disappear, protect themselves, hide, so take flight. What I wondered when you mentioned those cold nights in, in winter, how does a family group roost? Do they roost together? Do they make use of a disused nest? I mean, are they sitting on branches together or are they are they in a nest? How do they do it? So they have their dormitory area, each group. So they always go to their to the same place. It's, it's the place where they sleep is the same branch usually. And uh, and they sleep all together, not on the nest, but just they stay on the branch and they come close to each other and, and sleep together. It's, it's really nice and interesting to observe. And is there, when when they are in their little family groups, we don't know yet, do we, how closely related they might all be and if they're all brothers and sisters sleeping together. Yeah, exactly. It, it, we don't know, and and I think they don't know either. They might have an idea, but probably they they don't know. That's what we are trying to understand. If there is a way, there is some some signal in the call in the voice, but um, yeah, we will need a lot of data to answer to answer this question. But for sure, they they know each other and. and yeah, they take care uh, of each other, and and uh, even if they're not brothers and sisters, for example, an older subordinate, an older helper, which will inherit the dominant position in the future, and this is quite common in in the super fairy realm. Usually, sixty percent of the males that are helpers at the end become become dominant of their territory. So, having having somebody, having a, a subordinate. And taking care of your subordinate is something, in a certain way, good, which offers a lot of advantage because then will mean less work for you in the future and more what we call dilution effect. So the bigger is the group, the lower is the probability to be predated. And also many eyes together to look for predators. So it's like a safer place to be. So there are many advantages of being together in a group, even if like the bird you are like sharing all all your time with is not your relative. I'll throw one at you from left field because you mentioned you've worked in other countries and on other animals, animal types. How similar do you think the fairy wren society is to something that we've become quite familiar with through TV in recent years, the meerkat grouping? There is something that is really similar. They're both cooperative breeders, and so the, the, the main mechanism is is quite similar. Even if some of the rules, the, the machinery inside on how the groups and the stability of the group is maintained is, is quite different. For example, in birds, usually it's the female that that disperses, so that that goes away, while in mammals it's the contrary. But since you touch this. This topic, one of the main thing I'm, I'm, I'm working at, on at the moment is the fact that 
yet the society of the superb in a certain way could be really si more similar and on this being a multi-level society as i was saying before to some to society of very different animals such as baboons killer whales elephants and even zebras and and uh, these societies in groups that in a predictable way merge together forming upper social units it was something that was uh, considered to exist only in animals mammals mostly with big body and very big brain and long long life and because it was thought to be very demanding in terms of cognitive um, cognitive power being able to track all the identity of the individuals inside the group but also of other groups and and then what we are finding at the moment is that superbs are this this society and is really similar to the one of elephants and killer whales and even sperm whales in a certain way and there are very small birds of nine eight ten grams and that this could be more common in in all the animal kingdom given some particular rules some particular features that's not an answer i expected to get fascinating <laughs> fascinating i've only really got uh sort of one more question about the fairy wrens atore is how long is the lifespan of a dominant male or female and is it different to the subordinates in the group? Do they live longer or shorter or the same amount of time? No, they they live more or less the same amount of time. And usually subordinates in the future will become dominant. So so it's a kind of it's a kind of hierarchy. And after the four years, the probability of dying increases. And especially we observe um, that most of of the birds dying died during winter and especially for the super for the older males that, that tend to molt into the breeding plumage during winter to be the sexiest this is really costly and many of them die while trying because probably it's really costly in terms of metabolism and but also being blue when all the other are brown and it's, it's costly because Predators target you immediately, and but usually they they live at least in our population they live something like males three four years and we have individuals of five years at the moment but there are some individuals known from records to to live for ten years so that's quite interesting to be a a song a little songbird because it's really different from what we observe in the north northern hemisphere where birds live one or two years that's all birds of that that size but in the southern hemisphere and in the tropic birds tend to live longer and have different life history which is yeah. particularly good to study social behavior because they live long definitely and of course since we're talking about a complex social organization one one answer prompts another question. When when the dominant or the super sexy male loses his position, either th well, mostly through death, we will assume there's this layer of brothers or cousins of males. How do they determine? What's the process of selection for the next super sexy male? So in the territory, usually it's just the death. When the dominant dies, the following subordinates and the hierarchy in the subordinates is really stable. Okay. It will inherit their position. Okay, the so problem, it's it's already organised. It's not like all of the males, all of the subordinate males are all on one level. We have a defined hierarchy within that group. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Yes, and they and I, I think they know. And some sometimes. They can uh, subordinates can have a different strategy. Uh, they can it's called fission, and, and they can get their own territory, split the main territory in two, and get half of the territory. And, and if they find a, a female and stay there, and but otherwise they will just inherit the dominant position of their previous group. Okay. Well, I look forward to reading your work when when it's completed. How long have you got to go to to submit 
and then go through the process of defending it, which I learnt today can be a very stressful situation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid it could be very stressful. And I still have more or less one year, a bit less. So at the moment, I'm just, I, I already collect all the data I needed and I'm just writing up and writing the manuscripts and the thesis. So, yeah, I will enjoy these last, this last months just putting together and framing the stories of what I observed in the years of the fieldwork. I spoke to someone recently, Atore, who told me that while they were completing their PhD, they did their field work. Then every day, every night, they went down to the pub and then got up the next day, did their field work. And then when they were writing up after they'd collected all their data, they still had time every day to go down in the afternoon to the pub. Is that how you're finding it? Well, not not really. I try to find time for myself, but and and I feel when you write it's easier. It's mostly the big part is as is field field work because if you want to collect enough information, you need to spend a lot of time in the field. And uh, what I really learned from PhD is that you need to be really flexible because so many times things go wrong and don't go the way you expected and any things like gears can stop the work when you need it and and sometimes you you expect to see something and you go there you design the experiment takes months and then you go there and the animals don't do what you expect and that happened to me also and so that, that is quite stressful and and now I feel that is more relaxed because it's mostly writing and, and but at least I, I know what to expect because I've already got the data. Yes, but well, you have to really feel for those people who had selected sites that got burnt out in the bushfires. That really messes up your your research program. But hopefully all of the institutions have been accommodating with extensions and whatnot for that work to, to be able to be done. But we digress. I hope you will give me a summary when when you're ready to to defend the work once it's um, sort of in the public domain and we can talk about what you finally did discover and what all that genetic work brought out. And, and we haven't even talked about your ringing, your ringing system and the how you can identify the, the individuals. So there's still a lot of things to, to talk about, but I want to talk about you now, Atore. When did you become interested in birds or are birds only part of the wider tapestry for you? Well, I got really interested in birds when I was 10. And I was interested in general in animals, but then birds. I realized that they are everywhere. They are vocal. They are colorful. And, and it's, you can go around in the city and, and observe them and ask questions why wave mammals is so harder. Or fish. I, I was not living close to the sea, so it was harder as well. And 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 since ever, I've always been interested in, in birds, and then from there, in general, in biology, in evolution, and in broader in broader questions. And but I still try to use birds as a model species to answer my my questions because I'm still really related, uh, connected to 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 birds as a group of animals. As a ten year old in Italy. What were the, the familiar birds to you? What was your, what environment were you living in as a kid in Italy? So it, it is in the north of Italy and it's quite like hills and mountains. So we have many of the common finches, blackbirds and uh, little owls and uh, peregrine falcons. And, and uh, I mean, Many interesting birds, robin, but to me not comparable to what Australia or South America offer. Like especially Australia, like the, the great variety of birds and songs and that there is here. So I'm, I'm really happy to to study birds here instead of in Italy. So where was you? You briefly ran us through your academic journey, like with some time in Germany at. Max Planck and whatnot, but when you well, where, where did you do your undergrad work, and where has your academic career taken you? So I did my under 
I studied in Bologna in Italy and, and I went to Iceland for some months in the fjord in the north to study social behavior of seabirds and interaction between different species of seabirds, in particular a species of gull and the common eider. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it, but I felt it, it was a bit cold for me. So after bachelor, I, I moved to the Amazon, involved in another project with Macos in Peru. And, uh, and uh, that was really, I, I found like the right place for me there. And then I came back out there four times in different expeditions and working on uh, mixed uh, species flocks and uh, communication and alarm calls in the and and then I work on mixed species flocks on the population from from Oxford when I was in Germany that was after my master and and after that I I moved to to Australia and I start to work on the little superbs which species of macaw were you looking at I was looking at different species of of macaws mostly the red and green and the scarlet macaws. It was a population of a conservation population of macaws, so they were like the main study. It was on this behavior, which is the clay leaking. So all the macaws land on the clay to to eat the clay in the morning, and, and it was a long monitor of these long term monitors, and, and it was really, really incredible country and beautiful place. Yeah. One of the stock questions I ask everyone at Torre is, what's your field guide of choice? Now, you've been birding in Italy, obviously, and Iceland, in South America, and now in Australia. So run us through what your library is for identifying the birds you see in the different locations. So which book precisely I have? Yeah, what what do you prefer to use when... Let's start with what book did you use when you were a kid? In I tried to get all the possible books, and there were not so many. <laughs> so, yeah, all the guys. There is one that is very good. That is Collins, and and that was in English. So I didn't speak English. I was just looking at the figures, and and after that, there is one really good that is for Peru. That is my Bible and came with me. It is the Priston Guide of Peruvian Birds. And came with me for the four different expeditions in the Amazon, and it's already it's completely brown and, and changed color, and it's full of fungi. And then, uh, yeah, uh, everywhere I go, I try to get a guide as, as in the world as as a souvenir or, or to study in the future. And, and when I was a kid, friends were sending me guides from places that I didn't even know. And uh, and uh, but then, yeah, I still like to have them and, and imagine new travels and. But for Australia, I mostly use an app, which is this new thing that I didn't have when I was a kid, which is quite good because even if the the images are not not the best, there is still the call for each bird. So you can listen to the call. And since I'm really interested in calls and songs, it's a way to learn and to, to immediately check without carrying a book the distribution, the species, the identity, and, and, and the call of the birds. And since you're using the app in Australia for identification, but you are a collector of field guides, are you still buying the other field guides? Have you got the Australian bird guide in your bookshelf? Yes, yes, I have yeah. it. I have it. It was one of the first books when I arrived here at, at university. Yeah. yeah. And do you have the other field guides as well? Do you have the Slater guide, the Morecambe guide, Simpson and Day? No, I, I've got just that one. And I recently got one on by Ron Clark, with, who's a professor at, at my, my university, on where to find birds, which I'm, I'm really enjoying at the moment. Yeah. It's a terrific book. Terrific book. Uh, Rowan, ter- terrific, uh, terrific ornithologist. A great body of work behind him. When you are out in the field, what would you say is your essential piece of equipment? What can't you live without? Binocular, for sure. Well, without binocular, I'm useless. And for my work, if I need to read the color bands of the birds, I need my binocular. And then notebook, or sometimes I write data on on on, on the phone, and and then depends. On the experiment, I need other gears like speakers, mostly speakers and recorder for calls and songs. 
Now, that's really interesting to me. It's all right. What speakers, what sort of size would you take out? And are you playing the sounds through your phone or do you take another recorder out for playback? How do, how do you organise that? Yes, we have a particular uh, speaker, which is a tweeter, which is able to produce and give without distorting high pitch calls, so we is, which is particularly important for, for birds. And so I have that, which I connect to a battery at the moment, 12 volts batteries, and, and I've got also a recorder, and, which is a, a task 45 and to record to record songs and mostly i'm using it to record the distress calls so when when i got a bird in the net i come closer more or less 40 50 centimeters and i record the voice and then i use sonograms to analyze this this the spectrum of the voice and that's just a handheld recorder you're not taking out a directional microphone with a parabola or anything like that not here we use that in the amazon a lot that was the normal equipment there because the environment is more dense and the bears were farther away yeah so so we needed something like that here is not really necessary because like when the birds are in the net I can come quite close and so it's quite easy to to get a good recording with good quality and that's just using like the XY microphones on the recorder. Yeah, 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 right. I think a lot of people are familiar with the the handheld yeah. recorders, whether they be a Tascam or a Zoom or a Roland or whatever. But they're all very yes. similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's your favourite bird? Ah, that's a hard question. I don't know if I have a favourite bird. When I was in Iceland, I really loved the Arctic there, and. I- I find it amazing how far they can fly and how long is their migratory journey. And here, I, I don't know which which bird in Australia I, I particularly like, but in general, I, I like doorbells a lot. I really enjoy doorbells and, and, and how they, especially brown doorbells, even if it's really common, how they can mimic alarm calls and, and all their complex songs and and in South America uh, maybe the the musician Ren which is is an amazing that gives one of the best songs I've never heard it's really really beautiful is that a true Ren no I don't think so I don't think it's okay. a true Ren that's another one of these old world southern hemisphere mimic families yeah I'm not familiar with that one so I'll, I'll be looking that up after we finish speaking. Yeah, especially uh, the song. And it's so beautiful. And and researchers found that in many indigenous people, traditional songs, there is the, the motive of the of this of this bird. So it's quite culturally important bird in, in all the Amazon does in. And it's a rainforest bird or is it yes. more an open woodland bird? Forest. Okay. Terrific. Where's your bucket list location? to go and see some birds? I, I just like to travel and where I go, I, I just try to learn. More than a Twitcher, I'm really into learning where species are, where I can find species, what is their call, what is their behavior, and like the, the, the ecology of, of the place. So where I can find some species. And I would really love to, to be able to to hear a call and know where I am, that in the world, I think that's one of the one of the, the most beautiful thing for for an ornithologist. And where is your favorite place that you've been birding so far? The Amazon, for sure. Yeah, yeah the Amazon rainforest is for sure the, the best place I've never been, and and it's so dense of life, so so so. So so hard at the same time to see bears. And that is a challenge and all the time. It's so dense and sometimes it's just walking. You feel like walking at the bottom of the sea. You don't see really what is around you. And like everything is the same. It's just dense and green. And, and you hear calls and voices of birds from everywhere, from the ground, from the 
canopy and yeah, it's really magic if you like birds. I feel rainforest in general. Have you been to any of the Australian rainforest sites yet? Yes, but not in three yet. I want to go soon. I would really love to go soon. I, I did some bear watching on the Gondwanian rainforest. I mean, on all, all the temperate rainforest and then up to the Gondwanian rainforest, which I really love. Uh, beautiful place. And I would like to keep going up and explore also the northern part and, and also New Guinea would be a dream. Yeah, the New Guinea highlands would be amazing, wouldn't they? Yeah. So what's your bucket list bird? What, what, what do you mean? Well, is there one bird that you haven't seen that you've got you dream about that, you, you know, you want to see a scarlet ibis, you've probably already done that one. Maybe it's the Ragiana bird of paradise. I don't know. Well, he, here in Australia, in Australia, I feel in general the birds of paradise and bower birds is something I really want. And then, yeah, mostly these birds is something I would really love to, to see. Yeah, all, you, all of them. Have you seen the satin bowerbird yet? Yeah, I, I, I saw the satin bowerbird, yes. Yes, that's the only bowerbird I've seen so far. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hope you get to see the regent bowerbird. That's that's pretty stunning. Yeah, good luck with that one. When your when your work comes to an end, will you will you give me a summary? Will you come on again and talk to me? I would be very happy to to yeah to tell what we have collected and, and how we put all the stories together and have a better and more coherent story of, of this research. Absolutely. One of the great things that, that I'm learning about research as I come in from a completely different perspective is how your work builds on the previous work that people have done and then what you find out will open up more doors and raise more questions for the next team to come along and try and answer those. So it's it's really adding a huge amount of knowledge to one of our most recognisable little garden birds in, in southeast Australia, or certainly when I was a, a kid, they were everywhere. Unfortunately, not, not quite so much. Maybe you guys, your team will unlock the answer of why the numbers are declining even though those urban habitats that they used to be so frequent in are expanding the it would seem the number of opportunities for them to to exist in all these local reserves and new developments would seem to be there but they're not so. yeah, that's true that's true that's one of the main questions i think for conservation of many songbirds there is one try that is for sure is habitat fragmentation and habitat loss even fragmentation when it's not lost directly and that affects the social structure of population and genetics and many processes, but also climate change. And, and I think we will know some, something more from uh, about the relationship between climate change and decreasing in population of songbirds from the research of many great scientists that are investigating this topic at the moment. Well. You've done most of your field work now, so the hard slog is with the data analysis and writing up your your, your thesis and and then that process of defending. So hopefully it, it goes well. I'm sure it will be and that we'll be talking with Dr. next time we have a chat. Thanks for joining us on the Bird, Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. He's almost Dr. Atore. And hopefully it will be in the future. Yeah, I'm sure you will be. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.